I'm really happy to be running this session with you today on aligning with yourself with your self emotionally every day. And that seems like just such an important thing in our busy world to align with ourselves emotionally. So um, I, I'll tell you what I've just been doing. I This morning I thought, um, I really want to go and see the coffin come from um, Buckingham Palace all the way to Westminster Hall. But there wasn't really enough time to do it. But in the end, I decided, yes, I will go out and I'll do it and I'll, you know, be a sort of adventure and I'll get back in time. So I got back about 10 minutes ago and uh, it was very, very touching. I had to sort of push my way, <laughs> sort of push my way through the crowds to get to the tube to get back. But um, there was something very touching for me about marking the end of uh, an era. And of course, we don't know what's to come, but um, there's been a lot of change in this country. And, uh, you know, we need all the good people we can get. And she was a great person. So I'm a little bit worried about the future. But on the other hand, I think that um, King Charles might be a good man and might be an environmentalist and do some of the things that we need to do around the environment. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed for that. But I did want to mark this, this change in era for us here in uh, Britain. Um, and it's been such a big change for us over, you know, you know since, since she came to the throne, you know, from uh, empire to little Britain, uh, it's been the sort of decline and um, finding a new place in the world. So that was important for me to do today in terms of my own emotional alignment with myself. So we all have really busy lives and our education system is um, designed to put us in our heads and keep us out of our emotions and all the, the courtesies of the modern world and the etiquettes and behaving properly and even some of the good things like political correctness, all of those things, um, you know, are quite head orientated. And um, also, you know, my, my sort of view is that um, one of the things that the capitalism does and consumerism does is continually wants to distract us from the suffering of human existence and the mundaneness of human existence. And we've got so good at it so that we're all running around all the time doing being very busy doing things. And when we're not busy, we don't sit at the home, or not many people I know sit at the home and play the piano or do painting in their garden, which is what, you know, Victorians would have done. Um, you know, they watch some form of stimulation, a movie or listen to music or a show. We're all incredibly busy. So when is it uh, during the course of the day that you get a chance to sit down and say, what's really going on for me? We, we know what the big emotions are, you know, we know when we have a big, strong emotion, but what about the more subtle ones? And also, if you're, you know, you were trained like me, I was trained to ignore, you know, have a stiff upper lip and ignore my feelings and be brave and be tough and be strong. Very easy for me to override my emotions and, um, and to ignore them. So to have a, pr a daily practice of checking in with myself is really important. And I know that... Um, you know, I've got some friends here from from uh, mainland China that, you know, in, is, was the same is true. You know, it was very true in China that, um, you know, people had to be strong. People um, didn't express their feelings. Um, a lot of the housing had thin walls um, in the old days and people didn't express um, emotion or, or cry because they didn't want the neighbours to hear. And uh, a lot of different societies are like that. You don't... Um, it's difficult to express your feelings, to express your emotions. You might lose face, something of that sort. And yet, how do we stay aligned with ourselves emotionally? How do we nourish ourselves emotionally? The problem is that if you push a feeling away, it may come back and bite you on the bottom. You know, it may follow you around. Um, and particularly difficult feelings that, you know, if you've had some traumatic incident or, uh, you know, badly... Um, you know, badly loved in your childhood, or you didn't feel good enough, or any of those things, um, you can have difficult emotions follow you around for the whole of your life, and you, you, you've you learned not to pay attention to them. So part of the way back is to pay attention to our feelings and bring love and tenderness and kindness to ourselves. It's such a major practice. I would say there are two key practices in life. One is 
to learn to be loving and kind towards oneself, to hold oneself well, to hold oneself in a positive emotional space. And then the second really important practice is to, to find people who can look you in the eye and say, I see you, I get you, I know who you are. People who you can go and say, oh, I'm feeling tough today, or I've got emotional difficulty today, or um, something's going on for me today. Um, to share your vulnerability, to share um, your deepest heart. Those are two of the most important things in life. And, uh, and so today it's about holding ourselves well and being kind and sweet uh, and um, loving towards ourselves and holding our emotional difficulty with kindness. But I also just want to mention the other side of that, the importance of tribe or group. And there's a, an African tribe whose name I can't remember. They live in North Africa, where the, the, the land is quite arid and they're cattle farmers and they're looking after their cattle and they may not see another person for a whole day. And but when they see another person, this is the greeting. When they see someone from their tribe, the greeting is they walk up to them, they look them in the eye and they say, see me. And then the other person stops and pauses and feels um, the feeling of that person and then looks back and says, I see you. And so that's such a we all need that. We all need people in our lives who see us. And one of the the key things about um, the Life Talent Program and any of these groups, actually, but my Life Talent Program is finding a group of people who see you and get you and keep saying yes and say yes to what is great about you. You know, say yes to your strength, yes to your life calling, and yes to your vision, but also yes when you talk about difficulty, yes when you're hurting, or yes when you're angry, or yes when you're frightened and feel fear. To have people who can say yes to, to the whole of us, um, to the light side as well as the difficulty in us. Um, and uh, you know, it's so important to have people like that in our life. Our society is very designed around, you know, we go around at work or on Zoom or on Facebook, on social media, you know, showing how great we are and how wonderful we are and, you know, our strengths. But also we need to be able to show our vulnerability as well. And of course, one of the most powerful things is when even sometimes in a professional situation, a person can show appropriate level of vulnerability, of authenticity, of humanness. And, uh, and if we can hold the difficulty in ourselves well, then um, we're going to be more comfortable with showing that to other people in, in, an, in an appropriate way, in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way. And so that's what I want the subject of today, just to have a daily practice of checking in with ourselves. And um, so first I'm going to um, run a meditation on this. And then I may do some work with uh, you as individuals, um, see if anybody wants a little bit of coaching on this. Um, I strongly recommend taking, having some time every day for a psychological meditation. By the way, my glasses are steaming up because I've just run into the house. It's one of the unfortunate things about me is I'm a, you know, if I, if I move fast, I sweat. So if you see my, my steamed up glasses, that's what it is. Um, so um, to have a little time every day when we just stop and say, what's, what's happening here? You know, just to feel ourselves, to experience ourselves and to welcome every corner of ourselves. You know, Life is not about getting rid of the wounded places or the dark places or the difficult places in yourself. Life is about holding with love, presence and patience all the corners of yourself, all the exile selves, all the difficulty in yourself. Um, I was reading a Buddhist text the other day and they talked about bodhisattvas who have no accomplishment. The bodhisattva has finally given up trying to be anybody other than who they are. And so to just, can I love and accept and welcome all the corners of myself? By the way, that's actually a fast way to change yourself. You know, if I can welcome the angry me, 
then I can give some space for the angry me. I'm less likely to shout at somebody, you know, who um, drives badly in the street or, you know, or at my partner. If I can hold all the places in myself, I'm less likely to act those out. But that's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is actually to have, a, to have some time during the day when we're at peace with ourselves and when we're aligned in ourselves. And that has a double effect. The double, it's called the, the Abroaden and Build Theory of Positive Emotion. Um, you enjoy the feeling at the time, it feels good and aligned at the time. And also during the following hours, you'll carry some of that energy through into the periods that follow. And um, you will make better decisions, you'll communicate better, you'll relate better. Uh, there are lots of positive benefits that come that will come through. So the research says that if you have uh, a daily practice that's of mindfulness and personal alignment, a psychological meditation practice, if you have that, you will be um, more successful as a human being. And a pharmaceutical company, GlaxoSmithKline, um, did some research. They had they introduced a, an online mindfulness program for their managers. And then they compared the staff scores. Actually, Gordon's here. So, you know, don't tell anyone I'm telling this story because <laughs> Gordon used to work there. Um, that they compared the staff, the leadership scores, um, because they have an, uh, an annual survey where the staff give um, feedback on their leaders, which is a great thing to do anyway. Um, the people who did the mindfulness program got better results on average compared to the people who didn't. There was a significant difference in the people who'd done the mindfulness program. Because if you can be at peace with yourself for even a short amount of time every day, you're more likely um, to be, be able to be at peace with other people. And of course, that doesn't mean you know, always being, you know, super polite and super nice to people. You know, sometimes you may have to be direct, give them honest feedback, but to be able to give them honest feedback in a way that they can hear, in a way that your heart's connected, in a way that values them as a human being. You know, what, what's the test of whether feedback is good or not is, is whether the person can hear it, not that you've just told them what you think, but can they hear your feedback will they do something with it so um, my view is actually probably one of the most important practice of my life is in my life is my um my meditation practice which is more by the way i do more than just a psychological practice um i take it further than that but today it's about um a psychological practice of uh, in which we of curious and loving and compassionate about what's going on for us emotionally today and then how we can hold that place in ourselves with tenderness and love and perhaps a little wisdom perhaps we can you know bring kindness if it's a you know if the place in you feels like it's an you know it's the child in you or the teenager in you or a younger you or the baby in you that you know, if it's the baby in you, you probably just need to hold it, to hold that place in you. But if it's the kid in you, you might want to explain, hey, what happened was really painful. But maybe it's not that you're a bad person. Maybe they're just really stressed or whatever. You know, so sometimes a dialogue can be good. But let's do the meditation and, um, and then we can talk about it afterwards. Um, can I assume that, is there anybody here who doesn't know, the, who was very inexperienced with doing a sort of guided meditation and needs a little bit of information about why that's a useful thing to do? If there is, just put your hand up. Anybody who's, I would think that all of you do. Um, but I don't know you, Shao, Shao Su, so I'm just checking. Hi, Shao Su. Um, so, yeah, go on. Hi. Have you done have you done this sort of meditation before? Mm, not yet. <laughs> Great. That's good. Where are you calling from? Um, I'm from China, but I'm uh, in USA right now. You're in the US. Great. So it's yes. it's the morning. <laughs> yes, it's morning. Yes. Morning for you. Great. Great. So, um, so the first thing is like getting rid of all the busyness in our minds and 
And the way we do that is by bringing ourselves into the present moment. You know, the clutter is our thoughts about the past and our thoughts, you know, what are we were doing this morning and what are our plans for later in the day? And, you know, the things are all the things that we're thinking about. So the first thing is let's get ourselves present. And there are many different ways of getting yourself present and into a body, mind aligned state. There are many different ways of doing that. You could, for example, just think of a time when you really felt connected to life and you could see that time and you could hear what you heard then and feel how that feels. Or you could pay attention to your body. Uh, but my preferred method is to pay attention to everything in all the senses, what I see, what I hear and what I feel. And so if this works for you, you can follow this part of the meditation. So just making yourself physically comfortable. And sometimes people like to turn the camera off when they meditate. I actually find it helpful when people keep the camera on because then I'm actually responding to people rather than to a blank screen. And it's, you know, and the whole thing works much, much better when I feel I'm actually talking to people and then I actually get I'm getting feedback I'm getting I can see you so I'm just really feeling my body the first step is just feeling my body and I'm noticing my skin and the contact with clothing but also the air temperature I can feel my muscles, feel big muscles. Are there any places that feel tension? I'm just noticing the muscles. Sometimes it's good to pay attention to places you don't normally attend to. For example, your scalp or the skin on your nose. And I'm listening to the sounds. And I, as many of you know, I like to listen. Are there any sounds outside the window? And that's always interesting. I can actually, I can hear sounds from children in the street. But there might be little sound or there might be traffic or there might be birds. And then I listen for, are there any sounds in the house? And then I listen for any sounds in this room. For example, computer sounds, or for you, my voice would be a sound in this room. Then I listen for, are there any, can I, what can I hear in my body? And of course, you might be able to hear your breathing. I can actually hear the blood pressure in my neck through my ears. I can't quite hear my heart, but if it's quiet enough, you might be able to hear your heart. And of course, listen for, is there a voice in your head? Listen to it from the distance, like it's someone who's talking to you at a meeting. Be curious, be interested. But don't believe it. It's just a voice. And be curious. Where does this voice come from? Is there a feeling behind it in your body? Is there an emotion? 
that's connected? Are you anxious? Or is it just a habit? Chat, 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 chat. Is it telling you something useful? And just observe it from a distance. Be curious. It's only one of the many things that you can hear. And just to make sure that our wise adult mind is really turned on and present and that our hearts are open. Think of someone who really believes in you, cares about you, sees you, supports you. And it could be an old friend, or it could be a pet, or it could be a teacher who you didn't know well, but once looked you in the eye and said, you're going to do something great with your life, or you're really kind or have a good heart. Or it could be a saint or a Buddha. Some inner resource that really supports you. That reminds you of your warm, tender heart. You can see them. You could hear them. You could feel them. And actually, as a regular practice, developing a circle of supporters, people who are in your mind's eye, who you can call on. You can call on Buddhas, you can call on Lao Tzu, you can call on the prophets of every religion, you can call on Mother Earth, you can call on Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, people from movies, from your favorite, your heroes from your favorite film. You could see them, you could feel their support. Mother Earth, all the ocean, all the mountains, and storybook characters. Today, it's only, it's fine just to have one if you've only got one person in your circle of support. Someone who believes in you. But over time, you could begin to develop more. I have a whole gang. And the purpose is to have support for our warm, tender hearts. So that with our supporters and our warm, tender hearts, we can be curious, interested, loving, and compassionate about our feelings. And so bringing your warm, tender heart and the feelings of support. Check out your throat. Check out your chest. Check out your solar plexus. Breathe into your belly. Is there any place in you that needs holding, that needs attention, that needs love? that needs support. 
that needs tenderness. And bring presence, bring love, bring your warm heart with curiosity to that place. You know, is it a baby feeling? You know, the feeling of longing for love or loneliness. If it's a baby, can you hold the baby you? If it's a little kid, can you cuddle and talk to the little kid? If it's a 12 year old, can you be sweet with her or him? Or a 16 year old or a 25 year old? And maybe it doesn't have an age, but it just has a feeling. Sometimes the feeling of hurt from yesterday or somebody being mean this week or being unkind or being unloving it feels like it comes from this week, but it may be a part of you from long ago that's vulnerable or sensitive. Sometimes if someone is unkind, it reminds us of all the previous times that someone was unkind or our lo the loneliness or difficulty of our childhood. So we carry sensitivities from our childhood that can be touched in adult life, even by small situations. So whatever's touched in you, bring kindness, sweetness. It's like really bringing your heart. You know, if it's a baby, you hold it, stroke it, Tickle it under the chin, really bring your heart to it. If it's a child, you cuddle it, maybe you talk to the child. If it's a 12 year old, someone just going through puberty, which can be such a difficult time. Just be present and say, yes, I see you, I get your difficulty. If it's sadness, you say yes. If it's anger, you say yes. If it's fear, you say yes. If it's loneliness, you say yes. If it's grief, you say yes. Whatever it is, you say yes. Envy, regret. You're not trying to change it. You're just holding it. It'll change of its own accord if you just bring interest and attention to it. You just say, you sweet thing. I know a woman who says to herself, it's okay, little sister, it's okay. It's okay, little brother, it's okay. We talk to ourselves like that. There's a wise adult you with a warm, tender heart, with psychological resources, people who believe in you, or saints or higher powers that support you. And the wise adult mind and the warm, tender heart can be so sweet that any place in you that hurts or needs attention needs to be touched.
just bringing that curiosity that a warm tender heart to that place in yourself and taking a deep breath it's like you're not trying to change anything you're just being present with what is and if it hurts you allow it to hurt or if it's angry you allow the anger or if it's fear, just no, let the fear be there. Or if it's loneliness, let the loneliness be there. Just accepting. Because you're there, the wise adult mind is there. Your warm, tender heart is there. You know, crying alone in your room on your own is really different to crying when there's another presence with you. And sometimes we can be the present, the wise adult mind can be the presence, the warm heart that can be with a painful place in ourselves. Sometimes I just imagine breathing light from the sky or energy from the sky down through my body into that place as I'm on the in-breath. Very often my pain is in my belly. And I breathe it like a light or energy from the sky into my belly. There are many, many different ways of doing this, and you may have one already. Sometimes it's really helpful to bring, to remember when we're doing this, that really good friend who loves you, who cares about you and believes in you. And if they were here, they would listen to this place in you. You could tell them about this place in you. Or someone from a storybook who would listen to this place in you, you could tell this to. Or maybe you have a connection with some higher power, some tradition, some archetypal forces. some saints or great teachers that can listen to you, that can hear you, that you can share your deepest heart with, that can support you in being human. Sometimes particularly recently when I feel I'm serving Mother Earth. I can feel her presence supporting me. And actually I have the saints and teachers from a number of different traditions supporting me. So just being with yourself and welcoming yourself. Welcome. All the parts of you are welcome, welcome, welcome.
the nature of being human is to have great joy, even bliss, and to have great pain. And the ability to have the great joy is connected, is the same channels that have the pain and the difficulty, the same sensitivity, just at the different end of the spectrum. What I'd like to do is for you gently to come back, stay deeply connected with yourself. Actually, before you come back fully, there's one more step, which is imagine holding this place in yourself in the hours that come with love and tenderness. Imagine holding this place in yourself with love and tenderness during the hours that come. Being sweet with yourself. And there may also be a commitment that you want to make to yourself. A very short way of doing this meditation is to ask, first, what is my woundedness today? And then to say, what's my longing today? And then what's my commitment today? Is there something I can do that will support me today? So I'd like to do have a very short little exercise in groups of four, where one person talks, nobody gives advice, everybody listens and pays attention. And I'm just going to give you four minutes per person in the groups of four to say, how was the, first, how was the meditation? Um, how well did, and how well did you hold the feeling in yourself? You know, what was it like holding that feeling in yourself? And thirdly, is there any commitment? So first, how was the meditation? How was it holding the feeling in yourself? And is there any commitment that you want to make to yourself? And only four minutes per person in groups of four, starting now and I'll do the timing and one person talks and everybody listens and all the people who can listening can do is say all they can say is they can say yes or I hear you or tell me more they can't say anything more than that yes I hear you or tell me more or I'm sure that that makes sense and blowing up a balloon full of love and giving that to your younger self Mm. To, to inhale the love, you know, and just say it's going to be all right. And that was, for me, a very powerful exercise, and I remembered it during your meditation. I mean, do, yeah, mm. doing... So thank mm. you. What, what else? What else did you get? Let's hear from other people. What, what else? What did you... Just share a little bit. What did you get from the exercise? What worked well for you? What's difficult for you? 
Om. Om. So as you were, uh, uh, as I was recollecting the uh, teachers and then the college friends and then others and then the spiritual uh, people and resources and all. So my heart was going like this slowly. Beautiful. And it was finally like I was in the heart, you know. <laughs> the heart was at, like this is my inlet and this is my outlet, and this is the heart. The whole thing I was inside the heart. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. At a certain stage, then I sort of when he said to look into the, I, I couldn't find the places of pain immediately. It was everything was warmed and charged. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but then, so then I sort of, sort of, you know, what do you say, burst the balloon. And then I started looking at the painful places. And then I realized that the 20 year old pain, which I men mentioned before also, that still something is left of that, though I have worked on it. But that some, some so, you know, the, pain there, remains. Sort of, there, there are sort of two things that you're talking about that are so important. Um, yeah. One of them is that you were talking, you talked about this, you call it the non dual space in which everything has peace, everything has love, which is such a beautiful thing that you experience that. And, but sometimes it's actually really helpful to have a separation. And, and also, sometimes it's, um, really helpful to have a separation between the resources and the heart and the place that needs healing so that we can bring the heart to the place that needs healing. So both of those methods are really great um, methods. Um, so yeah, that's really beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Who else? Um, what was it like for you? Have you got any questions or? Marina? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Um, um, I love your meditations. I listen to them a lot and every time it works, I just, but I do conk out a bit. I've got long-term COVID, we think. But anyway, I listen to it at least probably four or five times a week. I love this one. I fell asleep again. But as soon as I get into it, I'm in that place you just said. I feel brilliant everywhere. Yeah. I don't, there's no pain or stuff coming in. Um, but generally on a day-to-day -day basis, I connect with things and I can notice wounds, I think you said, coming up. Um, but part of me goes, well, is that just the yakety yakety? And <laughs> if I listen to the entire internal dialogue, I go, oh, I'm feeling a bit this. I, you know, I kind of, I don't ignore it, but if it's the same pattern and I've got a plan to deal with that, if that makes sense, do I still need to be focusing on it? Because I kind of like being really present. Yes. And getting on with my day if that makes sense so that was one question and then the another thing I just want to mention while I've got a bit of air time I'm really concerned about the world and everyone being really busy on their iPhones on their social medias and not connecting with things and not really connecting with themselves but um yeah so it bothers me but yeah can we I'll go back to that I mean because I wanted yeah. to just talk with the, the first thing which is that it's a difficult one so you know so the, you know the enlightened master doesn't worry about the past, doesn't worry about the future, and just coasts in the luminosity and bliss of the present moment. Um, and when we can have that energy, that's very, very beautiful healing energy. Um, uh, you know, and so when we're doing that, that's great. Um, there's a danger that you get in some Buddhist communities, which is, you know, they call it the Teflon Buddha, you know, the Buddha who's disconnected. They dis because it's not in their body. The thing is, can we have this feeling of unity, but have it in our body with our throat and our heart and our solar plexus and our guts and our sex? Can we have it properly in the body? Because some people, when they, they go out to meditate and then they've got this, they're sort of disconnected from the pain, but they haven't transformed it. They haven't processed it. And so it's so super important to be able to have that in the body. And as a part of that process, you know, it's not that there's one method that's right you know um you know um there are meditation techniques where you start by bringing the energy of an external deity to yourself and then you become then then at the second stage you become one with that external deity so another way to say that is 
that I can imagine, you know, all the people who love me and believe me, care about me, and also, you know, the sort of spiritual powers that support me, filling my heart with this great energy. And then I can bring that to my gut, um, or I can even just bring the energy straight from those, you know, higher powers to my, to my belly, to my gut. And that's very, very healing and powerful to have it in the body. And then after that, sometimes then I can just relax and let go and then just be present with myself without having to imagine, you know, a circle of resources. And so there's, there's almost two processes. There's almost like the healing powers are separate from me, healing me, or the healing powers nourishing my heart so that I can heal myself. And then there's also the, the place where you just let go into that beautiful energy. And then it's happening naturally. The healing's ha happening. When, I can no, when I'm no longer judging the feeling in my belly as being hurt or pain or anger or sadness. So, you know, there are, lot, there are lots of different methods for doing this. Um, and it's sort of, you know, it's finding out what works for you. So, I mean, in my daily practice, I will start by remembering the people who love me and, and, and the sort of archetypal forms that support me. And I'll receive that blessing and that healing. And then later on, I'll just, once I sort of feel full with that, I'll just go straight into that energy and just be in that place of oneness in the present moment. I mean, the ultimate is that we can be in the present moment, you know, where there's really no past and no future. But, you know, we leave it, we lead every, everyday lives. Um, well, actually, no, let me go back a step to be in that place with us. So, you know, when I can give up my messages, my unhelpful beliefs, my disempowering beliefs from the past that I got from my childhood and be present, and let go of those and just be present here now. And I'm not thinking about who I'm trying to impress in the future, or what I'm trying to do or who I've got to be, but I can just be here. I mean, so at this moment, there's something completely miraculous. There's a miracle. A moment of the sacred is unfolding in this moment because I can look at this sort of plastic screen in front of me. And there are these images of these beings who've been transported. This visual image and sound of you has been transported through the ether. I don't know how. And here we are on this, this sacred realm called Zoom communicating across time and space. I mean, this is a sort of moment of the sacred unfolding, isn't it? And we can look at it rather than just say, oh yeah, Zoom again, I hate Zoom. You know, I spend so much of my life on Zoom. Wow, here is, I'm having a heart connection with Marina. Wow. And so that present moment can, is, can be joyful. You know, I've never met Bronwyn, I don't think, but there she is in her beautiful colored top and her beautiful hair, you know, wow. Who is this person? Um, you know, Lee Wei's here, wherever she is. I can't see her right now. Is she still on? Yes, there she is. And in, in by, by either side of her are two friends of hers who speak English and who perhaps are translating some of this for her. So, or maybe she's just feeling the vibe. So isn't it amazing, this moment? So that's the sort of, and what we want to do is we want to have more and more of this in our lives. That this is... You know, so when you do psychotherapy, when you do healing work, it's very useful to know, to, 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 you know, it's really great to know your resources, your life calling, your, you know, your life calling, your inner resources, the people who support you, love you, believe in you, your higher powers, all of that, your vision for your life, your strengths, to have all of those powerful resources. And then to, to apply that to the narrative, the story of your life, and that the story of my life, particularly for those of us who had difficult childhoods, you know, or events, traumatic events in our lives, there's a story of our life that impacts us now. You know, the, your life, how does your life story impact you? It impacts you, doesn't it? So we're on a journey of healing the impact of our life story. And then we hope that in the future, by applying these resources, we can heal. And so therefore we can have more of the future we want, a future that works better for us. And that's the psychological method. And that is also the sort of level one spiritual method, except that you're using spiritual resources for the support. 
But the level two spiritual method, the sort of, is when you just explode the past and you explode the future and you just have the joy of the present moment. And if we can glimpse that a little, that's really helpful. Very few, you know, not many people have the, the good karma or the inclination or the time to be able to completely live from that space. That's the space of a saint or a Buddha or a you know, bodhisattva. But even just a little taste of this story from the past is just a made up. I've attached, I made all this meaning from the past. Let me just come present and just let go of that for a minute. I think I've got to be somebody in the future to prove something to my parents or my peer group or my colleagues or some fantasy I have. I don't really have to. You know, in the space of the universe, you know, who's going to remember my little life? How important is my little life? Except that what's important about my little life is when my heart touches another person's heart. But, you know, I'm not Nelson Mandela or, Mah you know, I'm not going to be in the history books. I don't think anyway, you know, I, you know um, so, you know, so far that's not the story, you know, that's not the case. But when I touch your heart with love or I touch that is that is the truly value of my life or when I give my gift. But all my stories about who I'm becoming and I want to give my, you know, do something in the world that's useful, which is it's a fun game to play. You know, I really enjoy giving life talent program and giving my gift to the world, but not <coughs> the that it causes me pain or um, suffering. Does that make sense? So there's a sort of there are these three levels. There's the psychological level. Let me heal my story. Let me make the most of my strengths. Then there's this, the first spiritual level, which is let me invite higher power to heal me. Let me surrender to higher power. You know, let me be a servant of higher power, whether it's, you know, God or Jesus or Buddha or Lao Tzu or Mother Earth or one of the goddess figures or, you know, the love that Rumi expresses of from the mystical tradition from Islam or whatever it is that, you know, whatever it is, I'm, you know, let me, let me be surrender to that and be an expression of that. And then the level beyond that is this non-dual level where it's all stories that have been made up, you know, circulating, you know, my story of my past, my story of my future, which I've all made up. And actually there's only one thing that's real right now. And that's this funny box that's sitting in front of me with these pictures of images of beings who I can feel, strangely enough, and that's, this is it. And so it's just having a little taste of this is it and being able to replicate that. Do you know? So your daily practice, have some of that. And then you're walking and you see a tree or a flower and you stop and you, and you, you get into this is it. This is it. And then something else happens and you can say, this is it. Um, one of the mystics, Thomas Merton, talks about moments of noticing moments of the sacred unfolding. Actually, every moment is a moment of the sacred unfolding. But sometimes the child on the bicycle or the swans on the river or the perfect rose or the shaft of sunlight remind us that this is a moment of the sacred unfolding. And so we, what we want to do is we want to get to practice noticing more and more of the time these moments of the sacred unfolding. Um, that, so that's sort of, but it's not that the third level is better than the first two levels. It's actually that we need all three, you know. It's good to, to make the most of my personality of myself and to heal my wounds. You know, it's good to relate to a higher power as if it was separate to me. You know, source is everywhere, you know. Something came out of non-existence, out of emptiness, and into form. And all these myriads of forms, you know, billions and billions of forms are incredibly creative. You know, you look at a bird. So how on earth did that get here? There are so many forms. This incredible creativity of existence. Um, something came, and, and that is everywhere, and it's in every cell of my body. So that's the third level, when I no longer have to see myself as separate. You know, and it, but it's great to sometimes sort of pray to a higher power as if it was separate. But, but, not, but then to say, and take a deep breath in, and the higher power is here as well. You know, this, whatever the source of the universe is, 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 
you know, what is it? This is it the foundation of the cells of my body. It's it's this some whatever it is. It's whatever came into existence. So it's having all of that, and then that, that's sort of that's the life path. You know, so making the most making the most of what's great about us, healing what's difficult about us, surrendering to this thing, this life, and also just realizing that we are the expression of the source. This, we've never been separate from the source, you could say from love, from presence. We've, but we forget, but then we get barnacles, you know, like we get fluff stuck to us from life you know what marina's talking about too much time on facebook too busy running around the world too much trivial conversation too much absorbed with the, all the different um sources of information that continually hit us and then we get lost in all of that and we forget who we are yeah so that's quite a big speech isn't it <laughs> Um, any thank you, Robert. Um, any other questions about the meditation? I mean, so that's what a daily practice is about. This and the first level of daily practice is let me hold myself, let me welcome myself. Then the other levels can come. How can I welcome this? What other questions you have or comments from the meditation? Any other comments, questions? Celia. I had um, a sort of very positive, warm start. And as I got further into it, I noticed that my throat, and I've had COVID recently, which was very, very sore, suddenly got very ticklish and um, almost painfully so. And I just start to feel this isn't, this is something to do with what we're doing here. Because I was just saying to my group before that, um, I had a, a really good head teacher who was a nun and she believed in me. And so I just sort of felt her presence with me. Beautiful. And one of the things she was trying to say to me right at the end of school was you have to, you know, you are important, basically go out there and do what you want. And um, she was great. So it, just, it was just strange because I just thought where's this kind of really bad throat suddenly appeared from. Was it was the, is it coming from her or was it something calling to her or? I don't know. I think it was because she was sort of saying, go out there and do it. You know, and I was only 18 at the time. Um, and then I think I've kept myself fairly quiet in life. And there's sometimes I feel like going out with a megaphone saying, right, this is it, you know, <laughs> to <Right>. myself <laughs> and to others. A bit like someone talked about the environment and... Um, and I feel the same sort of thing, you know, that we've, we've got to start speaking out. So, but that's just it. It was just the getting into that warmth and then suddenly feeling something coming up in my throat was, I thought, quite interesting. And I don't know where it's got lost or if it is lost, it might just be, have been expressed. Sometimes, uh, oh, two things. First is, it's very, very easy to welcome you, the you that, that wants to go out with a megaphone. And in mm. fact, I'd want to encourage that you to be visible in the world, but also at the same time to also welcome the parts of you that are shy or not so certain or all of those. And in fact, if you welcome both sides, you welcome the side that wants to go out. That's powerful. And then you bring healing, love and tenderness to the side that's shy and is not sure whether it's OK to put your voice out. That's when mm. the real transformation happens. That's sort of the first. Yeah. Yeah, that's the first thing. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but I've forgotten it now. Um, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks. Oh, yeah, I did want to say something about physical symptoms. You know, there was somebody yesterday I know who had a sore throat and earache. Mm. Oh, actually, the day before yesterday. And, but she went to a workshop about being a, a psychotherapy workshop about being in the body. And by the time she'd been, that workshop had finished, she, she didn't have an earache or a sore throat. The physical symptoms are often symptoms of, of psychological things you know so yeah. it's, there's much more of a mix between psychological and physical than modern medicine makes out you know what else what else so oh, nobody's putting their hand up so celia um okay robert yeah go on you're on mute, Robin, so you need to unmute. There you go. 
Um, I just want to talk about the present moment with the, the death of the Queen. Um, this has impacted on me hugely because um, I was homeless about 12 years ago and I was in London homeless and I went to a place called St Barnabas which is where they tried to both home you and help you. The short story here is that I became their photographer. I'm a photographer who fell off his perch. Um, and I ended up being a photographer for the Eden Project doing the Chelsea Flower Show. I did it two years running. And how does this relate to the Queen, your feelings for the Queen? Um, well, I actually have her. Um, uh, in the room, I've just brought her in. I <laughs> you can see her there. Uh, so you photographed her at the Eden Project? I photographed her at the Eden Project and I met her there. And I'm just looking at the time since that time that I met her to where I am now of having photographed her. And what I'm coming to here is that I went out this morning <coughs> went into, bless you, I went into the local church. I was just led to go there and they had a book of remembrance and I just wrote in it, thank you, your majesty, for almost encouraged being there and visited, bless you, um, and being there for me and enabling the change to take place that I took pictures of her, um, it empowered me and suddenly I look back on that time 12 years ago when I was down and out. Mm. So now she's living with me, I have pictures of her and I salute her for what she did and the amount of love that she spread worldwide and her presence. Thank that, you, you know, I was touched by, by her and Thank she's you. now living with me. Thank you, Robert. Um, just to say that, I think you know, one of her gifts, you know, I don't want to get into a big conversation about monarchy. And in fact, I want to come back to something that Celia said, but um, that what, she had an ability, which actually lots of really good leaders have, which is that in a very short amount of time when she connected with people, um, they felt like she saw them. You know, so she talked to hundreds of thousands of people. Um, but she would stop and she would have a moment of conversation with people and they would somehow feel touched. And one of the ways she did that sometimes was with humor or things like that, but she was able, she learned, and in fact, she started, you can think of what an awful job it was walking around shaking hands with people all the time. It's really not for everyone, that job. Um, but she really had the ability to do that. And actually Prince Charles has some of that. Um, I noticed when I, cause I've seen him twice in the last week. And one time when he was going into, um St James's Palace he turned around and he looked at the crowd and it was felt like he looked at me and I just said wow it was like a little ping and just to broaden this from the Queen you know there are people who you may not have had much contact with but who just saw you and got you in an instant or a second uh, that made a difference to your life. And those can be in your resources. So your, the people who are your inner resources can be your, your best friends. It can even be someone who you had a great relationship with and then you fell out, but you can just take the memory of the place where you had the great relationship. You can take the moment when they saw you as the resource. And it, so it can be someone that, that you know really well who cares about you. It can be somebody that you had a great relationship with, but you're not so close with now. It can be somebody who blessed you for a moment. There was, you know, I can remember a teacher who just looked at me and sort of said, yes, to, someone who says yes to you. And it can be moments of uh, somehow you felt there was a moment when you suddenly felt the source of the universe in some way. And then, then, then you just go back to that memory. So there are many ways to, to do this. So Celia, here's the question for you. So how come you didn't go out with your megaphone as your 
the invitation of your headmistress? Oh, I think I have actually. Great. Oh what, yes, I have definitely. What way have you? Tell me what way you have. Um, I, I do. I was in social work for thirty-five years, and I was in the courts. And judges used to listen to what I said because I prepared it so well. I mean, it was it wasn't because I was some great person, but it was just I presented the facts well. Yeah. And, it, and what's calling it? you now? What's calling you now? I don't know. I've got a couple of choices because I have been a counsellor and I've said things there too. But it's I find it very difficult because there's so much criticism in the world and um, and I, I shrink away and I feel very wounded. And so I have to kind of build up the wounded bit. You're wounded by by what? By um, I think sometimes being on your own is very hard and yeah. um, going out there with your megaphone then becomes like, oh, gosh, do you really need to do this? Um, you know, so it's. And do you need to be on your own? <sighs> I'd like not to be on my own, mm. but it just feels impossible to find somebody who could be a soulmate at this point in time. So I'm being honest here. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I have a collection of, well, it sounds awful saying that, but friends and people who support me, like great people, fantastic. But it's not the same as having somebody you're very close to. I wonder though, actually, because I've had, big sections I'm actually in a relationship now but I've had big sections of my life when I was single and I think there's a level of emotional intimacy that's possible with friendship of of both sexes that people often don't do because they think that should be reserved for a partner but mm -hmm. actually you know I want emotional intimacy with lots mm -hmm. of people yeah so I really I'm inviting the place in you that wants emotion to take your emotional intimacies deeper you know, it doesn't, you know, putting it all on the one, you know, that really works well for some people because, mm. you know, because they had a good attachment. You know, you could say good attachment as children to their parents. You know, they had a stable emotional childhood. And if you had that, great, you probably have a great relationship and have a good partner. But if you're like me and you didn't have a stable emotional um, attachment to my parents and my childhood, then relationships are difficult for me. And so then just to accept that and then say, and also I can have friends, friends who I'm so intimate with, people might even think we were couples. Mm. You know, I have, and I look for people who I can just tell my deepest heart to. And I look for people who I need lots of cuddles. I need lots of hugs. I've got all my friends, both male and female, are all fantastic cuddlers. <laughs> um, and um, you know some of my you know men particularly in England you know they're not always so good at hugging you know heterosexual men are not always good at hugging heterosexual men in England you know and mm -hmm. yet but I found some you know who I can sometimes I you know it's quite funny I go dancing and this is a free form of dance called five rhythms and um, sometimes you know it's like Sometimes I think, oh God, you know, there's no woman I know well enough to have a, a really intimate dance with because there's all, you know, they, you know, people may think there are these other agendas, you know. And so, but I can see one of my heterosexual male buddies, you know, and then I go and have a sexy dance with him because he knows I'm not going to try and take him home afterwards or anything like that. You know, it's <laughs> like I, I crave intimacy, but I can get intimacy with my partner, but also with my good friends. And I've really spent because I had a lonely childhood, I spent a lifetime developing that. So that's my encouragement is right. let's deepen all our intimacies um, with people who, and to be really careful about, you know, so, so for example, one, you know, one of my rules is if um, I only have friendship with people where I support them and they support me, if it's a one way transaction, you know, I used to be quite good at supporting other people and then suddenly saying, hey, what's going on here? And support seems to go. So it's always two way for me. Um, it's both both of people are giving. Both people can be open. Um, family members or people I went to school with who can't really be op open their hearts. You know, I can spend a little bit of time with them, but they're not. That's not the that's not my tribe. Like, who is your tribe? Who are the people who really see you and get you? And if you don't know this, people go and look for them. Mm. You know, where are the social, you know, where are the classes? 
or the events or the places where those sorts of people hang out, your tribe hang out. And, you know, and you may have to go a lot to find the people. And then once you find them, you stay really connected with them. You know, I work really hard to stay connected with people. And I have friends of all ages, you know, the moment my, I've got a good friend who's becoming a good friend who I've known for about seven, I've known since she was 16 and she's now 22. She's, you know, she's, she's gay, she's lesbian. Um, it's, you know, there's, you know, I've got people of all ages. Um, and so that's something that really, because we need those, we, we need the inner circle of support but we also really need the outer circle of support. It's not enough. But there are some people who can just meditate on their own and don't need other people. And good luck to them, you know. But I'm, you'd say in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, you'd say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a yogi, not a monk. You know, I need connection. I, and I love connection. It's, you know, it's mm. sort of, this is, who was it who said this? Um, Kurt Vonnegut said, we're all here to help each other get through this, whatever this is. You know, it's like, this is it's a mystery, isn't it? And, you know, religious explanations for suffering. But I saw a thing, actually, I've saved it somewhere. Um, it was um, something that uh, a Jewish person in concentration camp had written on the wall. I can't quite, I wish I could remember the words. I can't quite remember it, but it was something like, God, you're really going to have to explain yourself to me. Something like that. You know, you're really going to have to ask me for forgiveness for doing this to me. You know, the religious explanations only go so far. There's some suffering in life that you say, I didn't deserve this, or this person didn't deserve this. It's not calm. You can't say it's karma. You know, so there is shit. You know, there is, there is shit in life, isn't there? Mm. And we're, we're all here to help each other get through this. That's the place I can make really good meaning. Um, and both, you know, to be selfish and have the quality of relationships so that we know that we'll be supported when th we've got people to talk to when things are difficult. And also that when they are in the ship, we can, we can be there. Um, you know, one of the best things that happened was a woman friend that I'm a platonic friend with, which she had a miscarriage and uh, but she, she was single, uh, you know, had a boyfriend, but she had a miscarriage. I was she called the boyfriend who she got pregnant by and she called me in the middle of the night and said, come to the hospital. And I was very, very touched by that. You know, I wanted to be there. So that's, you know, that's sort of the other thing, I think, is how can we lean more into emotional intimacy rather than in you know in that rather than into phones this is not proper relationship mm -hmm. this is not this is not there are messenger molecules we're not smelling the person we're not feeling their hand um so it's but it's both of those two any other comments or questions from the meditation how does this touch you particularly from anybody who hasn't spoken so far How's this touched you? So till um, someone says, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say something, if that's no. all right. Um, I missed the start, I apologize for missing that. I arrived about 40 minutes late, so you were well into the meditation by the time I arrived. Um, but I have found it quite useful. And um, we have met Julian in Atsitsa last year. Um, I, was the, I was the massage therapist oh, yeah. for the season at Atsitsa. Beautiful. Um, That's right, Bronwyn. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Uh, but, um, yeah, it, it's extremely helpful, extremely useful, and I've been really interested to hear what you've been saying about uh, welcoming yourself uh, all sides of yourself and and i'm very sorry i missed the start of the meditation because i think i would have got a lot out of it well hopefully um, it may, usually by saturday um the recording is on um 
in the newsletter that you'll get, you know, you, on Saturday, there'll be a link to the recording. It's just that the person who usually does the editing is in Slovenia, translating from Spanish to English. And Zoom is very suspicious about letting her have access to my recording. So hopefully it'll all be there. But, right. but, but all those, you know, the meditation will be there should you want to listen to them. Okay. Um, yeah. Great, beautiful. And I could feel, feel when you came on, I could feel you dropping into yourself and your heart opening. It was very, very nice. You know, sometimes when people come late, I wonder what's going to happen, but I could feel you, your presence. So it's really nice to have your presence. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Okay, Om. About physical, about physical symptoms when you were talking. Yes. I was uh, just wondering uh, about uh, what baldness is a symbol of. What what is a symbol of? Hair Baldness. loss. I, I don't like those models that, you know, that you get a book and you can look up a symptom and it sort of says this means blah, blah, blah. Actually, I think baldness is a sign of your virility. I think it, it, means, it shows that you've got lots of testosterone. So um, go on, you know. Okay. Um, but no, so it's more about so. Um, but I think the way to do it is 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 not to look up in a book and say what what is this a symbol of, but to actually check in with yourself. Oh, I'm feeling this. Where does this feeling come from? What's the vulnerability that's connected with this? Is there yeah. some you know there's some physical symptom going on? Is there some inner vulnerability that's here? Um, you know, last okay. year, last August, I. Um, I did some quite, had some massive changes in my life. I won't go into them, actually. Um, and guess what? I got um, some bladder infections. And I thought, oh, this is something long term. But once I settled down, they all stopped. You know, it's just like, what's going on that's making me vulnerable mm. this time? Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, Secondly, I really appreciate, uh, and I'm saying this from here. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate your making time for people here online, and then there you said yeah. you went to the hospital at night and all that. I really, as a, I salute you. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, I think some you know one of the ways of dealing with suffering in life uh, is to help other people. Mm -hmm. You know, when I do stuff for other people, I feel. Um, when I do stuff that's genuinely from my heart rather than, you know, feeling of obligation or guilt. There are some people who, as a kid, they learned that they had to help other people, but they actually feel resentful about it. You know, so if you're one of those people who helps other people too much, don't don't help other people. But for me, when I go to somebody to the hospital with somebody or I do an act of kindness, my heart goes, you know, opens. Um, but. I'm, not, I'd, uh, I'm someone who's got quite good boundaries and I'm very good at saying no to people. So I'm not somebody who's always doing things for people and then resentful about it. But when I choose to be supportive and helpful for someone, um, it's a beautiful thing, you know. So, um, I, you know, I've, I volunteered in a hospital with, with um, terminally ill people and... Um, and sometimes I was talking to someone who, who was never going to leave the hospital, but we had a very intimate conversation at the end of it. My heart, I felt bliss, I felt blissful sometimes, you know, with grief, bliss and grief together. So, yeah. Okay, so um, next week's talk. Did you have a question, Georgia? I just wanted to thank you for something very strange, which is that Robert and I, I knew Robert when I was uh, 15, 16, and we haven't seen each other since. And so that's well, well, over, <laughs> well over 50, 50 years. Oh. And I suddenly, I saw the Zappa photograph and the name and it, you know, it all suddenly came back. I was 15, 16. And so that was kind of my plan then. It's a long time ago. So that's, that's absolutely amazing. You know, anyway, we're now in touch. So um, it's just quite extraordinary. Whatever. Thanks, Georgian. Thanks. You can talk, you can perhaps message Robert and exchange contact. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I have. 
Okay. She hasn't changed a bit. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay. I want to keep going, actually. Yeah. So yeah. Um, great. Um, so just to say that. So next week's topic is about believing in um, yourself. So when we bring um, loving presence and these resources, both the psychological resources and the spiritual resources, to those places in ourself, we can heal um, disempowering messages that we learned um, in previous parts of our life. And particularly, the, the one of the things about families, it, you know, if I meet someone in the street and they're rude to, and they give me a disempowering message, I probably will never meet them again. So it's a one-off message. The problem with families is, is that if there's something slightly toxic in the family system, if there's someone giving disempowering messages, putting you down or telling you you're not good enough or telling you you've got to try harder or telling you you'll be, they'll love you only if da-da-da-da-da. The problem is that, the, and even if they're quite subtle messages, you get them again and again and again and again and again over a, num a large number of years. And so sometimes we can quite by accident and really not intentional from our parents or our carers end up with some disempowering beliefs about ourselves that come from from early in life you know and then that can somehow very often turn into you know we have a difficult father and then we have a difficult relationship with if we're a woman with a man and then we have several you know and we have a difficult marriage and you know then we can say god somehow come i've had such difficult relationships so one of the things that we can do is bring not only heal the feelings but begin to heal and turn around any messages about ourselves that are disempowering i'm not lovable or i'm not good enough or i've got to try harder or i'm the outsider or i'll i'll never find love or whatever it happens to be i'm too much or my feelings are too much you know whatever it is for you and so there's two components to the to wounding there's the emotion and there's also there may be messages that that undermine you that disempower you and so next week's topic is about um how we deal with those messages that undermine us um the week after that is everything is waiting for you which is about you know the potential the infinite possibility of of being human so that, that's exciting and then just to remind you as well that on Monday, the 1st of um, October, I'm just, I think it's Monday the 1st or it's the 2nd, I think maybe it's the 2nd, I'm starting you know, part one of the uh, 2023 Life Talent Program, which is Life Talent Level 1, Tools for Personal Transformation, nine weeks on a Monday night where we do life calling and um, vision and knowing what your strengths are and maximizing your strengths and healing emotional wounds deep but long deep exercises healing emotional wounds and self-belief we do sort of some of the key life talent things in much more depth than we do in these sessions over nine weeks and then there's um life talent level two starts in april next year so the life level one is nine weeks level two is 31 weeks you know when you've this year's group you know i'm in the middle of the um 2022 life talent program people are so bonded and so supportive and you know someone puts a message in the group god i'm really uh, i'm upset about x three people will offer to give them a coaching session it's very really, very very powerful what gets created there so also i think it's yeah next week there is also um a session where i talk about the life talent program um let me just check make sure that uh, that's got the date right yeah that's right next week um, from 6 p.m to 6 45 p.m um, you can hang online and I will talk about the life talent program and give you a bit more information about that but that's next week so um, yeah hope to see you here next week um, 4 p.m to 6 p.m about self-belief 6 p.m. to 6.45, and a Q&A on the Life Talent Program. So great to have you here today. We've got a couple of minutes. I want to do one last thing. Oh, Gianrico, did you have a question? Uh, no, thank you. It was um, for the course, which, which starts. Okay, now I know that after this, this, uh, after this um, session next week, 
we can talk about Q and A's about the uh, life talent, no? Great, fantastic, good. So, Gianrico, how are you feeling right now? Give us a word or a phrase about how you're feeling right now. Enriched. Great. Pass it to someone. I pass to Om. How are you feeling right now? We're passing it around the group. Feeling contented. Contented. Yeah. Uh, br brown wind hala. Uh, okay. Um, hopeful. Hopeful. Okay. Pass it to someone. Uh, George Ann. Um, uh, so amazed. Pass it. Oh, sorry, I've got to pass it. I'll pass it to Bobby. Well, uh, also known as Robert. Oh, I was, sorry. I, I was going to use the same word, amazed. Yes. <laughs> um, who else? Celia. Um, peaceful and hopeful. And um, I'll pass it to Roma. Positive. I'll pass to Barbara. Excited and happy. And I'll pass to uh, Gian Gianrico. Yeah, Barbara, I was, it was already my, my turn. Oh, sorry. Uh, who's left? Jiao Su or Li Wei? Okay, Jiao Su. Friendly. Say it and, again. Uh, uh, friend, friendly. Friendly. Great. So friendly. Yes. Great. I pick Li Wei. <laughs> Li Wei, are you there, Li Wei? No. I'm sorry. Li yes. Wei went to the bathroom. No, you went to the bathroom. How are you yeah. feeling? Um, I feel peaceful and love. Great. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Great. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, Jia Mei. Jia Mei. Nice to see you, Jia Mei. Uh, nice to meet you too. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming today and for all the good feelings. And look, look behind, look who's standing behind Robert. <laughs> good. good. Lots of love to you all. See you next week. And love to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bronwyn. Thank you. See you.